Hey everybody, this is a presentation of History Maker Baseball. I know I've been playing a lot of History Maker Baseball, but I haven't really done a video for the newer folks or the folks that haven't seen this game before to kind of give you a background on it, its inner workings, the philosophy behind the game, uh, and that sort of thing. So I thought about doing that for this video, but at the same time still playing the game itself. Uh, maybe not a whole game, but at least a uh, playthrough sample of play using Game 7 of last year's World Series between the Cubs and the Cleveland Indians. So again, this is History Maker Baseball from Play.com. Keith Avalone, the creator of the Play.com franchise. And in my opinion, this is by far and away the best Play.com game that was made. Now, I have not played the golf game yet. I uh, have not played the football game. I bought the football game. I haven't played it yet. I bought the hockey game and played it a couple of times, but uh, baseball is still in my blood, so maybe uh, in the wintertime I'll go back to hockey a little bit or when it gets to the fall, when next hockey season rolls along. Uh, but I'm primarily a baseball guy, hence the channel name Baseball Demos. So this is going to be a overview of History Maker Baseball the ins and outs, the how-tos, the uh, hopefully the strategy behind things or the reasoning behind certain things, and what makes this game different from all the other games that are out there. So sit back and relax, and I'll be right back with the start of this presentation. Okay, there is the rule book that comes with the game, and it's in looking through it, it is very uh, easily understood. It's well written. So the learning curve on this is very, very small. Um, so once you read through that, it should uh, the game hopefully will uh, make sense right away. This is the actual game playbook, and this is where the heart of the engine is, is in this playbook. And let me get the cards out of the way here. So this playbook, version 4, where to go here? Version 4.0, it's the latest booklet they have, copyright 2015. We flip over, and this is your main page, or pages that drive the game itself. Now, the way the game is played is with dice, of course, but they're red in a, they're red in a certain pattern, not by color, even though there are three different colored dice. They are red numerically, lowest to highest. So in other words, if you rolled this right here, it would be a 2, 4, 6. And the reason they're read that way is because the book is set up that way. The lead die is the window pane for the results. So the lead die of 1 gives you this large window pane because obviously with the lead die of 1, you have many other options for other numbers to fit in. A lead die of 2, it gets a tiny bit smaller because you've taken away the 1s there are no ones in this because the lead die of two is the smallest. So you got a, sm a smaller window there. And then over here you got an even smaller window with the lead die of three, even smaller lead die of four, even more smaller lead die, die of five, and then finally with lead die of six. So that's the way they're rolled is, or the way they are represented is lowest to highest. There's also a very neat little contraption called a decider die. And that's a six-sided die where three sides have a dot and three sides are blank. And this is because the game does not use statistics. It uses qualities about certain players. But not all players are set in stone to have a certain quality. They could be borderline between a quality and not having a quality. And that's where the decider die comes in because you roll that. And based on whether it's a dot or not will be whether or not the player gets that particular quality. So, we're talking about qualities. Let's look at the player cards. So, for instance, we're going to take a look at Dexter Fowler, at his card. And you can see they don't have stats. There's no numbers on here. It's simply qualities. And they're given a quality on batting, fielding, running, and experience. This game uses something called experience, so the veteran player will get an advantage, possibly, over a rookie on certain results. So, let's look, and you can see that with the qualities given here, all three of these have little black dots. That means when the dice are rolled that the decider die has to be a dot in order for these qualities to take effect. 
based on what the book is asking for. So in short, you roll the dice, you read the book in the numeric order that comes up, and then you check the qualities that are asked for against the card of the person who's batting at the time. So let's take, for instance, let's, let's change this around to a, we'll make it a uh, three, four, six. So let's suppose the real roll was a three, four, six. Check it, let's make it a three, four, five. Three, four, five. So we're going to check three, four, five. That is the roll with the decider die as a dot. All right, the first thing you're going to do is look at the pitcher because the pitcher gets the first chance at affecting the bat. So we go to where the three, four, five is, and it's asking, is the catcher iron? So it's really not asking about the pitcher this time. It's asking about the home team catcher. Is he iron? Well, the catcher in this case for the Cleveland Indians is Roberto Perez. He's actually gold. He's not iron. So that check will fail. So when the pitcher check fails, you move on simply to the next check, which is the batter check. All right, since that check failed, we go to the batter check. It's asking, does the batter have a good eye? Dexter Fowler does not have the good eye quality. If he did, it'd be written right here in the batting qualities, but he doesn't have it. So we skip that. And then it says it's a strikeout. Sometimes it's asking about a fielder, but in this case, it is a strikeout. So in that case, Dexter Fowler would be a strikeout victim and be one away. And that leads me into the micro charts. You notice on the book, there are several instances where there are colored results. One in blue, one in red, and one in purple. There are three micro charts that are color coded based on the results. One is team chemistry, one is a baseball right now, and one is player experience. The baseball right now is based on the pitcher or the batter, pitcher and the batter's last performance. So if a pitcher strikes out the previous batter, he'll be hot. If the batter strikes out himself, he'll be cold. If the pitcher gives up a hit, he'll be cold. And if the batter gets a hit, he'll be hot. Um, if it's in the middle and earlier innings, then he, there'll be semi-qualities, and the decider die will determine whether or not they're hot or cold. The player experience microchart talks about whether they are an icon or a prospect. In other words, a veteran or a rookie. And you check the qualities of the players and, and roll the dice and see what happens. Team chemistry is also part of History Maker Baseball. And team chemistry uh, will determine whether or not the team has harmonious qualities, whether they're in harmony together, or whether they're a little bit dissonant between themselves. There's clubhouse problems brewing or whatnot that translate onto problems on the field. So that can happen there as well. One thing I probably should have jumped to first is some of the game day charts because this game in itself, what sets this game apart is it's not like Stratomatic, it's not like uh, APA, it's not like Payoff Pitch, it's not like Replay Baseball, and it's not like Status Pro. It is not trying to recreate a previous season. It's trying to start a season from opening day and go forward to create your own history, which is hence the name History Maker Baseball. So what you do is you start on opening day, and then you progress, and as the season goes along, you'll have ebbs and flows. Your team will be harmonious. Your team will be dissonant. Your team will get perks. Your team will lose perks based on your losing streaks. You'll have injuries. All sorts of things can happen. So, how does the game day chart work? Well, normally what would happen here is you would do this starting with game two because you really need to play a game before you can get to this chart effectively. I'm playing game seven of the World Series, so my previous game is game six of the World Series, which was won by the Cubs. So the Cubs were the winner. Cleveland was the loser. So what you do is roll one die, one die and if the die is higher than the losing streak, or then the streak, I should say, then that team will be either harmonious or will be dissonant. 
I'm sorry if it's less than, not higher than, if it's less than. So since the streak was a 1, we would need a 1 from both rolls to be on this chart. If it fails that, then we go to the decider die roll, which is called a clubhouse mood finder. And you're going to frame a yes-no question and see if the decider die comes up as a dot for yes or as a blank for no. But before you do that, I mean, it really doesn't matter where you do it, but the book says, or the instructions say, to designate a hot and cold player. So what I did is I went to the Game 6 scorebook and saw that Chris Bryan had about three or four hits, so he is the hot player for the Cubs. Dexter Fowler took an offer. He is the cold player for the Cubs. Kipnis was the hot player for the Indians, and Carlos Santana is the cold player for the Indians. All right, now we need to roll the red die, or it could be the, any color you want, I guess. But we're going to roll, first of all, for the Cubs since they did win. And if this is a one, then they will be automatically in a harmonious mood. It's a five, so they're not. So we need to go to the club mood finder, clubhouse mood finder, with a yes-no question. Are the Cubs ready to win this game today? It's a dot. No, they're not. So since they're not, they are going to be in a dissonant mood or semi-dissonant. Semi-dissonant mood. And they're going to be looking off of the stormy chart. But first I'm going to put on the on their score sheet that they are semi-dissonant. So it reminds me to know that they're semi-dissonant on any chemistry roll. All right, then we're going to roll the black die. If it's a one through five, then we're going to look off one of these message charts to see if any activity happens. If it's a six, then we check for an injury. It's a three. So the three says team trainer. All right, so we're going to roll 1d6. If it's a five or a six, it's a non-issue. If it's a one through a four, then we just follow the trail of what it says. It's a one. So the one says issue with starter pitcher. All right, we have to know which starter it is. Is it today's starter, last game starter, whatever. So we're going to roll. Oops, let me put this on the book where you see it. It's a six. So the six is next game starter major issue. Well, there are no next games because this is game seven. If there were a next game, there would be a major issue with the starter. So for kicks and giggles, we'll figure out what the major injury would be. So we'll come down here to the major issue and see what it is. And that's a five. So it says medium term injury. So this is one, uh, one die times another die games. So we'd roll two dice. And that's a, a one times five, so that's five games he would miss. So the pitcher would miss five games, basically missing a start in the rotation. But for our purposes, since this is game seven, there is no future game, so there's no effect, other than the fact that they are semi-dissonant. Now for Cleveland, see if they have a one-game losing streak. That's a two, so they're not going to be dissonant. So we'll go to the mood finder. Are they ready to finally win? Yes, they are. So they're going to be semi-harmonious. We'll mark that on the score sheet. And they're going to roll off the sunny chart. So we're going to roll off the sunny chart. It's a four, so that's a front office. So I'm going to check the front office and see what's going on. Again, if it's a five or a six, it's a non-issue. If it's a one through four, something's going to happen good for the Indians. It's a two. So the two says a major perk, major perk with player. All right, now we need to figure out which player it is. And they're listed here. It's a six, so it's a pitcher. Now, which pitcher? So we come down here to figure out which pitcher it is. It's a four. That is last use reliever. So the last use reliever, and I don't have the score sheet in front of me, but I'll figure out who it is, and that person will get a major perk. Now, what's the major perk? The major perk comes up right here. They can either be happy till further notice or hot until further notice. Oops, let's roll it where you can see it. That's a four. So they are going to be hot until further notice. So on the right now chart, no matter what has happened uh, with their previous at bat, when it comes to the right now chart, they're going to constantly be hot until further notice. And I've got to figure out who that pitcher is. I don't know if it's uh, Andrew Miller or someone else. I have to go back and look at the score sheet and figure that out. But that's the game day check for both teams.
Now, another thing that makes this game a little more interesting as well is you have umpires. And umpires have the same kind of qualities that the players have. Uh, not the same qualities, but the same they have qualities that are checked the same that a player would be. And sometimes the umpires can affect the game, and sometimes they're not. I have pulled out the umpires that actually umpired Game 7 at the bases they were assigned to. And we have Sam Holbrook behind the plate, Chris Guccione at first, John Hirschbeck at second, Marvin Hudson at third. Down the right field line is Joe West, and down the left field line is Tony Randazzo. Now in the game itself, the, there, are no, there are no umpire checks for down the line. I just put them there for aesthetics and the fact that they were part of the umpiring crew for this Game 7 of the World Series. All right, this is the way the game board looks. you got your spot here for your home pitcher, your visiting pitcher, your visiting batting order, and your home batting order. And then you have a spot for your dugout for your reserve players and your bullpen. And over here for the home team, you have a spot for the dugout of reserves and the bullpens. Again, the playbook is what drives your uh, results. There's also called what's called drama charts. There's an infield drama chart, there's an outfield drama chart, and there's a plate drama chart. And we'll talk about those once we get there, but they're they're you, you're sent to those based on these roles that come up as outfield drama, infield drama, or uh, let me find the one for let's find the one for plate drama. It's in here somewhere. Now I'm drawing a blank on plate drama. Oh, it's right here. Plate drama. Two, three, four is a plate drama. All right. Now there are also within the results there are little icons that will override the original result. So for instance, if the result was a 226, it would be a fly out to left field. But there's a little thumb there that says if the batter happens to have the whiffer quality, he won't fly out, he will strike out instead. So that captures uh, the players that are more likely to strike out than others. So uh, while the game itself is not, you know, stratomatic where it's not going to be percentage point by percentage point accurate, it does um, capture a pretty good representation uh, of baseball, and the players' ratings do factor in. Um, I am playing the 87 Braves replay, and I can tell you through about 65 games that the stats are, are pretty, pretty decently in line um, from what you would expect. So the game engine definitely, even with the qualities, it does have its kudos. But this is primarily, it's, it's meant to be a game. It's meant to, for somebody to have fun from opening day, taking a team through all the rigors of a 162-game season with the ebbs and flows, injuries, and so forth. And like the title says, you're creating your own history. All right, so let's go through a sample at bat before we start the game. So what we do is you roll all three dice plus the decider, and Corey Kluber's the pitcher, Dexter Fowler is the batter. So this is a sample at bat, and we're going to roll, and we get a 3, 4, 5. Remember, they are red lowest to highest. It doesn't matter about the color. So 3, 4, 5. 3, 4, 5. And that's the thing. I think that's the one we just did with... Let me roll a different one, because that's the one we did earlier. I want to get a different number in there. So you don't see the same thing over and over. All right, we get a 1, 1, 4. All right, a 1, 1, 4 with a blank on the decider die. All right, a 114 asks, is the pitcher fresh? Well, the definition of fresh is the first three innings of the ball game. If it's innings one through three, he is fresh. If it's four through six, he is semi fresh. And if it's after the sixth, he loses all freshness unless he has a shutout going. So, in our purposes, it's the first batter of the game, so he is fresh. So, that would mean Dexter Fowler would ground a short, and that's the end of the bat. You don't have to go any further. Once the check solidifies under the pitcher, you don't even need to check these others. But let's say, for instance, we were in the eighth inning and he's no longer fresh. We would skip that check and go over to the next check. Is he sad sack or patient? Dexter Fowler is semi-patient, but the decider die says he's not patient. So he would not foul out to the catcher. He would instead single to right field, and that result would be in purple, which would send us to the chemistry chart for the next at bat. So but in this case he would have in this case he would have grounded a short because Corey Kluber was in fact fresh. 
So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of the path of the result on a, on a roll. So we're going to go ahead and, and play an inning here and, and hopefully everything will make sense as you see it in action. It's Dexter Fowler against Corey Kluber. And we get a 1-2-6. Generally speaking, a lead die of 1 is better for the pitcher. And the higher numbers are generally better for the hitter. Not always, but generally. So it's a 1-2-6 with the dot for the decider die. So we go to the book and it says 1-2-6. Is he fresh? And that's where all your fresh rolls are coming from is, is column 1. Is he fresh? Yes, he is. It's the first batter of the game. So he will line out the second. So Dexter Fowler hits a line drive right to Kipnis for out number 1. And Fowler is retired. So that brings up the DH, Kyle Schwarber. And it's a 135. Now the 135 is when you get to 135, it's blank for the pitcher, it's blank for the batter, and it says unusual results. Now this is the one time, or just about the only time, that the color of the dice make a difference. So when you go to the unusual results, when it's a when the one is a black one. That's the ballpark check. When the one is blue, it's an umpire check. And when the one is red, it's either going to be memorable plays in the field or balks and bogeys, depending on the color of the black die. But in our situation, it's a blue one, which means that's the umpire check. So we're going to check the umpires. And to do that, you go to the umpire chart and use whatever the base running situation is. In our case, the bases are empty. So we're going to roll, when you check these mini charts, you only roll two dice plus the decider die. And we're going to check one of the umpire's qualities and see if he affects the game. So the roll is a 2-4 with no decider die. So 2-4 says, do we have a respected umpire at second? Well, if we go up to second base, John Hirschbeck is semi-respected. He is semi-respected. The decider die says he's not respected. So in this particular bat, he is not respected. So we come down to our check, 2-4, respected umpire at second. No, he's not. Had he been re respected, he would have a better view of the play, overrule an incorrect call by the first base umpire, and the batter would be out. I'm sorry, has better view of play, overrules incorrect call by first base umpire, batter rules safe at first. So if he was respected, he would get that. But since he's not respected, batter's going to be out. Now, a lot of times these results don't tell you how he's out, and for a lot of people it doesn't really matter, but if you really wanted to be technical, um, what I usually do is I look at who's batting. It's a left-handed batter, then I generally say he grounds to second. But there's other people that use dice rolls to figure that out. Uh, most people don't care. They just say it's an out, and that's all they worry about. So it's whatever you decide for your game. All right, so that's two outs. Ground ball to second. Makes the second out, and here's Chris Bryant. And like I said, had Hirschbeck been respected, he would have overturned that call, but in this at bat, he was not respected, so he did not overturn Chris Guccione's call. Here's Chris Bryant. It's a 1 2 3 with a dot. So 1 2 3 says both flash and fresh. Now, the flash quality means he's a strikeout pitcher, he strikes out a lot of batters. So we know he's fresh because we're in the first inning, but does Corey Kluber have the flash quality? Corey Kluber does, in fact, have the flash quality. So that result will be a good one. It's a strikeout. So he strikes out Chris Bryant, and the Cubs are gone in the top of the first. So an inning runs just like that. So we start the bottom of the first. Kyle Hendricks is the pitcher for the Cubs, and Carlos Santana will be batting for the Indians. A one four six. So again, we go to one four six. It asks, does the pitcher have flash? Well, Kyle Hendricks does have the flash quality, so that is a strikeout. However, there's a second symbol behind this. It's an eyeball. The eyeball means that it's possible for this not to be a strikeout. So we come down here to our secondary chart underneath at the eyeball, and it's, it's the good eye eyeball. And it says, batter avoids strikeout, ground out, runners advance one base. Well, the bases are empty, so it doesn't matter. But Carlos Santana, while he is semi-patient, he does not have the good eye. So unfortunately for him, the strikeout will stand, and Carlos Santana is out via the strikeout. 
So Santana is out, one away for Jason Kipnis, second baseman. And we get a 2-5-6. So we go to the lead die of two. 2-5-6. Two, is he a struggler? Well, there's a couple of ways you can be a struggler. One, you have your rating of a struggler on the card itself. Or, if you've given up three consecutive walks or hits, you become a semi-struggler. Then the desire die makes you a struggler. If you've given up four consecutive hits, then you become a full struggler. In this case, Hendricks is not a struggler, so we bypass that result. We go to the batter card. Is he a champion or is he patient? Kipnis, if we look at his card, you don't see the champion or the patient quality listed anywhere. So we skip that result. He's not champion or patient. So we go to infield drama. So we've got our infield drama check, and that's the chart here in the front of the book. And it's going to test one of the infielders' fielding ability. And on the mini chart, we roll two dice plus the decider. And if we look at the defense on the infield for the Cubs, Bryant is gold, Russell is semi-gold, and Baez is semi-gold. All right, since the decider dies a dot, all three of them are gold. So the only one who's not gold is Rizzo at first. So the result is a was a 1-6. So come up here, 1-6, shortstop gold. Yes, he is. He's semi-gold, but the sire die says he's gold. It's a diving stab of a sharp grounder robs batter of a base hit out at first. Otherwise, sharp grounder through short. So it would have been a base hit had he not been gold, but he made the play. Diving stop throws Kipnis out at first for out number two. And that result was in purple. All of these results on those mini charts end in purple, most of them. Some of them in red, but most of them in purple. So that means we're going to the chemistry chart for the next at bat, which is going to be Francisco Lindor's at bat. And from our game day check, Chicago Cubs are semi-dissonant. The Cleveland Indians are semi-hot. So we will use the decider die to determine if they are dissonant, hot, or dissonant, harmonious, or neutral. All right, so the dot is there, so that means both teams are either going to be harmonious or dissonant. And we got a 4-6. So 4-6 says pitching team dissonance. Yes, they are. The sire die says they are. Pitcher distracted allows a walk. Otherwise, that would have been a line out. So Hendricks got distracted because the team is dissonant, and he got a walk. Now, had the had he been a pregame check of being happy, he would have bypassed that and would have still gotten the out. But... He's going along with what the team does. The team was dissonant because of the decider die, so he allows the walk. Now it brings up Mike Napoli with a runner at first. Oh, I need to roll all three die. That would help. All right, got another 1-3-5 on our hands. This time it's a red one, so as we've seen before, that's going to take us to the back here with a black 5 and a red 1. That takes us to box and bogeys. So it's another mini chart. We'll roll two dice plus the decider and see what it says. And the cider is blank, and it's a 1-5. So 1-5 says rain delay. Roll one die. One to two, game resumes later. All players will be cold. A three to six, the game is called. Ignore for indoor stadiums or dry climates. So we're going to roll one die, and everybody will be cold once this game resumes. Or if it's a three, four, five, or six, it'll be a rain out. It's a one, so the game continues, but there is a there is after a delay. So the rain delay says that all players are going to be cold. So anybody who thought they were hot, like Chris Bryant and Kipnis, are now cold. So everybody's cold. Everybody's cold, including the pitchers and everything else. They're cold. All players are cold. All right. So that means that... Napoli still at bat because his at bat did not get resolved. But there's been a big delay and now everybody's cold. So now Napoli's out there. And we get a 1-1-1. One, one, one. Triples are usually good for the hitter. So 1-1-1. One, 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 and it's going to ask, is the pitcher an ace? Well, Kyle Hendricks, fortunately for him, he is an ace. He does have the ace quality, which is the best quality a pitcher can have usually. So it's an ace. So that means he's going to ground out to third. And the inning is going to be over. Had he not been an ace, then we would have moved on to the batter, asking if he has a scrapper. Now, a scrapper is somebody with little power, kind of a punch-and-judy type hitter. He would have gotten a double. 
Mike Napoli is actually a home run king, which means he's a big power hitter, and he would have had a home run. So the fact that Kyle Hendricks was an ace prevented a two-run homer from happening. And it's simply a ground ball to third, and the inning is over. And we go to the second, and I'll play one more inning just to uh, kind of go more at normal speed so you can see it more at normal speed. But hopefully you're, I'm hitting a lot of the results that you can get to in this game. So up to the bat is Anthony Rizzo against Kluber, and it's a 1-5-5. It is blank for the pitcher. Is he a home run king? Anthony Rizzo is a semi-home run king. Unfortunately for Anthony Rizzo, the decider die is a blank, so he's not going to be a home run king this at bat. So he does not hit a home run. He instead flies to center. So he hit it well, but not well enough, and center fielder Rajay Davis fielded it. Four out number one. Brings up the left fielder, Ben Zobrist. And that's a 166. 166 ask is the pitcher a workman. A workman is a pitcher that's not very effective. He has a high ERA and gives up a lot of hits. Well, Kluber is a star, which is a good pitcher. Not an ace, but a star. Certainly not a workman, so we skip that result for the workman. Is the batter a whiffer? Is the batter somebody that strikes out a lot? Ben Zobrist does not have the whiffer quality, so he does not strike out a lot. So it's a ground out to third base. And that's interesting. With the, uh, It would have been a double play. I'll, I'll talk, I don't, haven't talked about that yet. Uh, it's a 5-3 ground out because nobody was on base. And that results in red, so we'll be going to the experience chart on the next at bat. But one of the other slick mechanisms of this game are these little blue uh, rectangles here that talk about base running advancement. You don't have to figure out or read a chart to figure out how the base runners advance. This tells you. On a lead die of one, a ground ball is going to be a double play. So had a runner been on first, that would have been a 5-4-3 double play. A lead die of two is a fielder's choice. A lead die of three is a fielder's choice. A lead die of four through six, the runners will advance. So you don't have to look at a chart and figure out, you know, did he? Did we get a double play? What, what, what happened? This tells you. It tells you on sacrifice flies. It tells you on base hits and ground balls. Uh, how the runners advance. So in this case, it's simply a ground ball to third because the bases were empty. It would have been a double play. So that brings up Addison Russell. And that's a 3-4-6. 3-4-6 is blank for the pitcher. It's asking Addison Russell, is he eager? Is he somebody that doesn't draw a lot of walks? He swings all the time. Is he eager? According to this, he is not eager. So he did not swing at that. So he will not fly to center. Instead, he will walk because he wasn't eager. He drew a walk. He was patient enough to draw a two-out walk. And that it says here if he's an active runner, he would steal. But he is neutral on his running rating because there's no rating there. So he will not steal. But it is in purple. And that means that we will go to the chemistry chart for the next bat by Wilson Contreras. And again, the Cubs are semi-dissonant. And the... Indians are semi-harmonious. All right, they're both neutral now because the decider die is blank. So it's a 2-5. Pitching team distance. No, they're not. This time, the decider die is not making them dissonant. They're going to be neutral. Had they been dissonant, it would be lack of hustle, modestly hit ball drops in for a single. However, uh, well, actually, the Indians would be harmonious anyway. So either way you go, it's a fly out to right field. So the fly out to right field, since they weren't dissonant, ends the inning. And that does it for the Cubs in the top of the second. We go to the bottom of the second, still no score. Go back to our main chart. And get ready for next at bat for Jose Ramirez against Kyle Hendricks. And that's a 5-5-6. Five, five, so we come down here to this chart. A lead die of five, 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 six. Is he an ace? Well, again, Kyle Hendricks being an ace gets Ramirez to line to third. Otherwise, he was looking at a double. So the fact that he's an ace, he was able to stop that, and it's simply going to be a line out to third for out number one. So obviously ace pitchers have a big effect in this game of slowing down the offense. Here's Lonnie Chisenhall. And that's a 2-2-3 with a dot. So 2-2-3 two, two, 
Ask, is the pitcher wild? No, he's actually a control pitcher, so he's not going to be wild. He won't walk the batter. Is Chisenhall a slugger or utility? Chisenhall is a hero and semi-eager, but he's not a slugger or utility, so he does not line out to short. So he's going to single to left field. An active runner would steal, but he is neutral. So it is Chisenhall with a one-out single. So Chisenhall, a one-out single, brings up Rajay Davis, the left fielder. I'm sorry, the center fielder. It's 3 4 6. 3 4 6 is blank for the pitcher. Is he eager? We've had this role before. Is he eager? Rajay Davis is semi eager. You see that dot there. But the sire die says, not this time. He's not eager. This is bad. He's patient enough. And he's going to be patient enough to hold out for a walk. So he will walk. An active runner would steal, and he is active, but. Chisenhall is in front of him at second base, so he can't go anywhere. It's simply going to be a walk. And that will move Chisenhall up to second base. And now we've got the number eight hitter, Coco Crisp, but that result was in purple, so we're going back to the chemistry chart for Coco Crisp. Now, one aspect that's optional in the game that I haven't talked about, I'm going to pause the video and go get those, and those are called manager cards. And I'm going to go ahead and play one uh, for this at bat so that you can see how those operate as well. And like I said, they are optional. You don't have to use them, but a lot of people like to use them. So I'll pull those out and we'll see what happens on this chemistry roll after a uh, manager card is used by Joe Madden. Okay, so the game comes with several manager cards. Some of them will give you an advantage on a right now check, like this pep talk. Some of them will send you to the right now chart for a manager influence. So suppose you've got a red hot batter and he's not very experienced and the book says we're going to the experience chart. You can override that by sending it to the right now chart using the manager influence. There's a stolen base one where you can attempt a stolen base by trying to get a jump. There's a video replay challenge. So if the umpire if they disagree, or if you disagree with their result, you can try to get that overturned. Uh, in that result we had earlier about the second base umpire being semi-respected, since he was not respected, he'd be a one through three. You could roll one die, and if it's a one through three, the call would have been overturned. So you get a challenge on that. You get to attempt to bunt as a strategy. You get to add or remove a pitcher quality. So if you want to add, make a pitcher an ace for one at bat, you could do that. If he's struggling, you want to remove the struggle quality for one at bat, you could do that. That's a, a visit the mound card. One for each team. And there's an attempt to hit and run. That's another option. There's an attempt an extra base. So even though the book says you only get one base, depending on the speed of the runner, you can attempt that extra base by rolling one more die and checking that out. Now we get to the chemistry ones. There's dugout chatter. Manager chatter improves team chemistry for this at bat. A distant team becomes neutral. Neutral team becomes to gain harmony. Now, on the the Cubs are semi uh, dissonant, so this if they wanted to play that card, that would make them neutral, um, so they wouldn't take a chance on the sire die making them dissonant. The other option they have in the chemistry is argue with the umpire. Now, there's danger in that. You can argue with the umpire, and any team gains harmony on that next result. But there's a caveat. You roll one die, and if you roll a one or a six, the manager gets ejected, and you can't use any more strategy cards the remainder of the game. So you, the perk is you go from dissonant all the way up to harmony, but you take a chance on getting your manager ejected and not being able to use any more cards. So Joe Madden is going to live on the edge. He wants his team to be harmonious, so he's going to he's going to go argue with Sam Holbrook, the first the home plate umpire. He's going to give him you know he's going to give him once over, let him know how bad he's been calling the game. He's going to try to fire up his Cubs. So by doing that, he has now made them harmonious for this result. But we've got to roll the one d six to see if it's a one or a six. If it's a one or a six, he'll be ejected. It's a one, so, so he just got himself kicked out of the game. And they will go ahead and, and be harmonious 
for this uh, one result here, but they cannot use any more manager cards the remainder of the game, and Joe Madden will have to watch the rest of the game from the clubhouse. So, but he, I guess for this one result, he did get what he wanted. He got his team to be harmonious. So they're going to be harmonious while the Indians are semi-harmonious. So the sire dies blank, so they are going to be harmonious. It's a 4-4. Four, four. And we're talking about the pitching team because the Cubs are, I'm sorry, we're talking about the uh, Cubs pitching team. It says pitching team dissonance. So the sire die was blank, so they would not have been dissonant anyway, but he didn't really want to take the chance. So had they been dissonant, he would lose track of a ball, roll into the corner for a double. Otherwise, deep fly to center is caught by the center fielder Fowler. So the catch is made for out number two. Crisp is out, but so is Joe Madden. He's gone from the game. And with two on and two outs, it'll be Roberto Perez stepping to the plate against Hendricks. 5-5-5. Five, five, five. Remember, triples are good for the hitter. 5-5-5, five, 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 ace or star. However, ace pitchers eliminate that. So Hendricks, again, being an ace, it's a deep fly out to right. Uh, Perez, had, it not, had he not been an ace, Perez was a scrapper, so he would have only singled to center. Any non-scrapper, non-punch and duty hitter would have hit a home run, but the ace check from Hendricks stopped that cold anyway. Fly to right, and the inning is over. So after two innings, we would have no score. So that's History Maker Baseball. You saw you know, the manager card. You saw the manager get ejected. We've seen... Uh, The chemistry roll, we've seen the micro chart of drama. Uh, we saw the unusual result play twice, once with the umpire and once with box and bogeys. So that's the, that's the kind of neat stuff that can happen in History Maker Baseball. Um, you know, like I said, we're not really worried about uh, statistical line by statistical line trying to recreate what happened 30 years ago. We're basically, in this game, primarily taking opening day and working our way through a season with the ebbs and flows. However, if you want to replay a game like this 2016 World Series, which the teams are a free download from Play.com, you can do that, and you'll get credible results. So that's History Maker Baseball for you from Keith Avalone and Play.com. Just a quick overview. Um... Trying to think if I've forgotten anything else. One thing you can do, and I've used this for my Atlanta Braves replay, Al Wilson, who's one of the early proponents of History Maker Baseball, on his site, he has free places that you can download ballpark photos. So the ballpark photos act just like this first page does, but instead of having the little cartoonish guys on there, we can put the pitchers and the players in their positions and it looks like this. Now, of course, if I had Progressive Fields picture out here, it would look a little bit more interesting rather than Fulton County Stadium, but you get the idea. It kind of, you know, a little more aesthetics to the game, and it also has the ballpark qualities already on here, so you don't need to scramble to get the card, or the game also comes with a whole page of ballpark qualities for every, every ballpark that's ever been used in the major leagues. Um, so you can have that as well. So that's another perk is using these sheets by um, Al Wilson. Another thing that you can do is they have an, what they call an uh, instant table result or instant results table. You can take the winning percentage of two different teams, and roll two D6s, cross-referencing against the table, and get an instant result of a win or a loss. So if you want to play one team through a season and quickly play the win-loss records of the other teams, you can do that rather than trying to play each and every team. Lots of ways to play the game. There are fictional sets. Um, I've created many of my own sets, minor league sets, uh, fictional set, um, Swedish team, Switzerland team, um, the Strat Stratville 9 from all the guys from the Stratomatic community. Put them on a, a couple of teams and played some games with that. So really there's almost, you know, the sky's the limit kind of a thing for, for History Maker Baseball. It's your own universe. You control it. So you can uh, decide, uh, you know, how you want your league to go or how you want your games to go. 
if, you know, depending on how outlandish you want to be or how realistic you want to be, it's up to you. But uh, it's quickly becoming one of my favorite games. And since I've been playing this Atlanta Braves replay, the I had a question about this, the statistical uh, results you would get from a game like this, but they've been pretty credible and believable from what I've seen through 60-some-odd games. So uh, I'm a believer, uh, much like uh, the Monkees and uh, Neil Diamond saying, I am a believer in this game, History Maker Baseball. And uh, it's a game I, I play quite a bit. I'm playing through, the, like I said, the 87 Atlanta Braves season, and I've recently re-kicked in my 2016 Baseball America fictional set replay. Played a couple games for each of the teams there. I'll eventually whittle it down to just one team and play them through a season because that's really the ideal situation in History Maker Baseball. Take a team all the way through opening day to the end of the season and or playoffs. So, and I'll show the score sheet that I downloaded free from uh, the free stuff site on the website for play.com. And it's got a place for your lineup. It's got a place to put the experience level, how they run, and their fielding. So if they're an icon, if they're a prospect, if they're a semi-stoic, I put an S there, say they're slow, semi-stoic. Uh, semi-gold means they're semi-gold. And then the score sheet is done by at-bats versus innings. So the first at-bat were these three batters. That incorporates that block, represents what happened in the top of the first. Put a line under here with a number one, and that tells you that that's what happened in the top of the first. And then you go all the way through second at-bat, third at-bat, and so forth. There's a place to say how many strategy cards were used. So in our case, we would have marked off one for the Joe Madden usage of the strategy card that got him uh, kicked out. It's a place up here to put their moods, semi-dissonant, semi-harmonious. It's a place to put the field and the uh, ballpark effects, normal and big, for progressive field. It's a grass stadium. Place for the umpires to go. Place for the visiting pitcher and pinch hitters. Home pitcher and visiting pinch hitters. So it's a pretty neat little score sheet. There's also a couple places here for till further notice. So had we been playing another game, I would have put the Cleveland pitcher getting the uh, perk for the next game. But, of course, there is no ne next game. So, But it would have gone here either way. So the score sheet is very handy. And it's a free download from Play.com. So I'm trying to think of what else. I'm sure I'm missing a whole bunch of stuff. People that have seen this game forever or played it a lot probably say, oh, you missed this and you missed that. And I probably did, but... Um, I'm hopefully, hopefully I've captured the essence of the game itself and what it's all about and why it's such a great game and why I enjoy playing it. Um, trying to think if there's anything else out there. I mean, there's some micro charts that I can get to, like fence and glove and score, but like I said, you can't get to everything. Um, let's see what else is out there. Plate drama, that's checking pass balls and wild pitches. And the umpires will come into play not only in just the 1-3-5 result, but when you get these orange results on the plate drama, that also sends you to the umpire chart. So I think that pretty much covers it the best I can come up with. There is a, a separate page if you choose to use it for uh, weather effects. Um, I tend not to use it, but you can, obviously. And that can change the ballpark from maybe from a, a small ballpark to a normal or big ballpark if you get the wind blowing out, wind blowing in. If it's cold, the ball won't travel as far and the pitchers won't be as fresh. So that could affect uh, the game itself. So I may, I may get back into using that. I don't know. I'll have to debate about that. But uh, it's been 49 minutes on this video, and I don't want to bore anybody to tears that's seen this game quite a bit. Because you'll be seeing me play this quite a bit here over the next few months. It's going to be my primary go-to game for my videos. Be it the 87 Braves replay or the 2016 Baseball America replay. So, But I haven't really done one that much that I'm aware of. The way I just talked about the how-tos of the game. And uh, I'd been kind of defaulting to Al Wilson and... Uh, Steve Towers videos for that, but 
felt like I ought to at least put something out myself and give my perspective on it and uh, say what a great game it is. And Keith Avalone, a very slick design of this game, makes it very fun. It, one of the uh, hallmarks of this game is, or any game really, is that once you finish it, you want to immediately set it up and play it again. And that's that's definitely happened with this game. Um, in fact, I've been known to sit down and play a whole three-game series in one sitting while I've got all the teams there and everything and the umpires just kind of move everything around and uh, fill the score sheets out and go from there. So definitely kudos to Keith Avalone for this game and all the Play.com games. And they've got a great community on Facebook. You can check that out. Um, I'm sure there's other lots of other videos. Just search history maker baseball on youtube and you can probably find a whole bunch of them um, tabletop earl has done a couple and of course uh, al wilson and steve tower have done a bunch uh, Kiefer fairbanks has done quite a few um, there's probably a few others that i'm forgetting about but it's gotten some good uh good exposure but it never hurts to give it a little bit more and uh, maybe let people see maybe the inner workings instead of just tuning into a game uh that's being played uh abruptly where you don't really like what's he doing why is he doing that what's the result you know what's the reasoning behind that well this kind of hopefully will at least give a something to whet your appetite about another great uh, part of this game is you can create your own players it's very easy to do there's a player creation uh, guide that they sell uh, but you really you don't even need that you can use your baseball cards or any stats off of a baseball uh, website and kind of you know get very close to the ratings I mean, obviously, if there's a uh, somebody like Clayton Kershaw would be an ace, and somebody like uh, Bryce Harper would probably be a home run king with all the home runs. So you, you can kind of get a feel that way. But there's an Excel spreadsheet, very easy to create your own uh, players and your own umpires for that matter. So the sky's the limit, as I said, on this. You can be as creative as you want. Gives me a chance to get away from reality a little bit. And not worry about, uh, you know, I hope this you know team works itself out to be this winning percentage because that's what they did in real life and I'm going to try to match it. I'm not bound by those restrictions. And I'm not bound by, um, you know, this guy should bat first or this guy should bat third or whatever. Now, I am doing that for the 87 Braves replay to try to test the game engine. I am using the actual as-play lineups. So I'm trying to get this, uh, you know, I'm just doing that mainly to test the game engine. But for the fictional set, it's all hands on deck and it's anything goes. I'm letting it go, uh, you know, and be creative as I want. And it's actually very, a very rewarding experience. It's a great game. Good uh, diversion from reality. And you get sucked into your own little universe and kind of delve into that. And you can get lost in that. And those players start to become... Uh, you know, your creation, uh, even though they're created by Keith Avalon, they, you put them on teams and you uh, manage them through and they kind of become your little baby, so to speak, as you follow them through a season. So that's it from here. Hope everybody has enjoyed this presentation of History Maker Baseball. If it's something you haven't seen before, hopefully this will give you a better look at it. Uh, if you've seen it off and on but really didn't know that much about it, hopefully this is explained some of the ins and outs of that game and then of course you got to see a couple innings of it played in real time so you could see all the mechanics at work or at least most of the mechanics at work uh, the only thing that i didn't mention was the left right splits and there's one result in the game book which talks about left right splits it is the three five six result which asks is it the same so if a right-handed pitcher is facing a right-handed batter that's a strikeout same as the lefty facing a lefty if it's a lefty facing a righty or vice versa, then we skip that and we go on to the next chart. It's not an automatic hit. If the batter is utility or sad sack, which means they aren't very good, they're going to ground a short, but everybody else is going to single. So in case you were curious about lefty-righty, that's the only lefty-righty uh, result in the book. Uh, when I first started playing this game, I'm like, man, there's no lefty-righties in here. What's the deal with that? But it's amazing how often that 3-5-6 roll will come up and will come up to bite you when you least expect it. So... When you bring in a pinch hitter or relief pitcher, you can't always just bring in the best guy. You might sometimes have to play that platoon because when you don't, you get bit by it on that 3-5-6. It'll come up and bite you. All right, I think that covers about everything. Um, 
if I can't remember it now, I probably never will. So, um, hope you guys enjoy your afternoon and enjoy your weekend. Or if you're watching this in the middle of the week, enjoy your week. And uh, if you haven't checked out History Maker Baseball, I, I definitely think it's worth a look. Uh, Keith Avalon is great with his customer service, so if you've got any questions, simply uh, write to them. There's, I think there's an email address on the play.com website that you can write to him and ask him any question you want. There's certainly a big community out there on Facebook. Um, you can ask me, you can ask Steve Tower, Al Wilson, some others on some of their videos. Just post some questions and they'll be happy to answer them for you. I'll try to answer it the best I can. And there's also a message board for play.com where there's lots of questions that are answered on there as well. So until next time, I'm signing off and this is a presentation of History Maker Baseball. And until next time, I will see you down the road.